Welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. My name is David Goldsmith. I'm a kidney specialist working in London, England. I've had a very long interest in the disease that comes with diabetes. For the purpose of this lecture, we're going to call it diabetic or diabetes kidney disease. Don't forget though that kidney patients with diabetes can get lots else wrong with them as well, not just diabetic nephropathy. But for the purpose of what we're talking about today, we're going to assume that the commonest problem, that is diabetic nephropathy, is the one that we're going to be examining. And we're going to see how that interacts with the CKD and how in the last four years, because it's really only very recent, there are some new therapies available to us now, which are showing increasing promise. And I think most people would say it's time for a real overhaul of what we think we're trying to achieve when we're giving patients treatments. And if there's one lesson to come out of what I think about it, and hopefully what you'll consider thinking about it, is that you're really dealing with diseases that cross boundaries. So diabetes affects kidneys, kidneys affect diabetes. And if we throw in cardiovascular mortality, which is hugely increased in diabetes and CKD, it's actually quite artificial to think that therapies are just there to treat diabetes or just there to treat kidneys. Even when you think about uh, renin angiotensin system inhibitors, and we'll talk about those in a moment, let's not forget that they have cardiovascular protective benefit as well as kidney protective benefit. And the point we're going to make today is that the new treatments that are available in diabetes, they were developed to try to reduce blood sugar. Well, okay, maybe they do. Maybe that's helpful. But the real benefit of using them isn't, in fact, very much to do with the sugar concentration, but it's much more to do with other things that they do while they're doing the sugar. So we'll see, we'll see how that pans out. But I want you to start with that feeling that diseases don't respect silos and drugs don't respect silos as well. So we have to be thinking in a joined up way. In fact, cardiology, diabetes and kidney need to work together always in this group of patients. Now let's begin the lecture itself. So greetings from London. We're going to run through a, quite a number of things to do with diabetic kidney disease and its interaction with uh, kidney, kidney disease in, in general and cardiovascular mortality in particular. And we'll see a number of different things that have been tried. Now, we all know that diabetes is a very big global health problem. And when you consider that all of the growth in world population will take place in Indo-Asia and to a lesser extent Africa from now until the end of this century, so another 81 years time. I want you to have a look at the number of cases of diabetes that are developing and are projected to develop by 2040. And you will see that South Asia will see nearly a doubling. Western Pacific will see an increase of around 60%. Africa and the North, uh, Middle East and North Africa are doubling, but from a lower number base because of poverty, because diabetes, at least type 2 diabetes, is a disease of affluence. And because it's a good thing that many parts of the world are becoming more numerous and more affluent, but there is a downside, and the downside is seen straight away. If you look at Europe, North America and the Caribbean, we have got as prosperous as we can ever be. We'll never be more prosperous than this. It's arguable that we'll be less prosperous than this. The whole direction of the world is pivoting away from the West and towards the East. And with that will come all the challenges of diseases of acculturation. So this is an interesting demographic that we need to uh, be aware of because countries need to prepare for what will follow. And perhaps using some of these treatments that we're talking about today will help us. Uh, cause less problems with uh, these underlying cardiovascular and kidney risk factors. If we look at the US RDS from a couple of years ago, you can see that over the period 1999, and I'll bring an arrow in to show you, over the period 1999 here, 
right across to about 2012, 2013, the odds ratio of having diabetes as a cause of kidney failure has increased very significantly. And in the same period, hypertension, which was, more, was a bigger risk factor, has declined. All this is telling us is that because of that increase in diabetes, we're now finding that diabetes and not hypertension are, is the dominant player. But go back to what I just told you. Everything is linked to everything else. So in the context of diabetes, what's a normal blood pressure? The answer is low and are rarely seen in clinical practice. Blood pressure elevation is almost ubiquitous in diabetes, but the two factors interact and the prevalence of diabetes is increasing much faster than any change in the prevalence of hypertension. So we have to look at these two risk factors right side by side. But the news is bad. More diabetes means more diabetic kidney disease, more cardiovascular disease. So what's estimated is that in all countries, CKD will increase in prevalence. If we build this slide, you'll see that it's a little difficult to see, but you'll see between 2012 and 2024, in Denmark, Iceland, Italy, and Spain, there is a monotonic increase in the prevalence of diabetes, the number of people affected per million population. I don't know that public health measures will affect this because we know what we need to be doing, but in practice, it isn't happening. The change that's required here is on a government level, and the effect is no more significant and no more successful than the effect to try to change climate change. In other words, it's a complete failure. So if we uh, go on to uh, the fact that it's going to increase in prevalence across the whole board, then what we see is that in the United Kingdom and the Netherlands, the same thing happens. And what we find, and this is one of the most important slides there is, is that while the increase in renal failure is happening, there's a huge increase in death. The risk of death in these diabetic patients is 10 times higher than the risk of progression to end-stage renal failure. If you're listening to me as a nephrologist, your prime motivation will, should be, probably will be, the prevention of kidney failure progression. And I do think that's really important, by the way, but we mustn't forget that patients will simply die of something else. If it isn't end-stage renal failure, it will be cardiovascular disease. So in our treatment to prevent the progression of, to end-stage renal failure, it would be very helpful if this treatment also reduced the risk of death. And we have to put these treatments that we're going to consider for diabetes up above the, uh, the, the things that will happen uh, as a result of the drugs themselves. So we have to understand that all drugs may reduce blood sugar. Not all drugs have additional actions beyond that. And this is one of the biggest excitements in this area in the last four to five years, as I was saying. Now, in terms of diabetic kidney disease, there are many drivers and there are many diagrams and you can all have your favorite path of mechanism. You can come at this if you want from the point of view of hyperglycemia. I think we have to because hyperglycemia is a cardinal feature. And this, by glucose-dependent pathways, increases oxidative stress, advanced glycation products, uh, and protein kinase C uh, stimulation. We get lots of growth factors. We get a pro-inflammatory milieu. And then as a result of that, we get the functional and structural changes here in the glomerulus with the mesangial expansion, uh, both the mesangium and the cell expansion at the same time. Let's throw in some high blood pressure um, or obesity, if you like, causing systemic hypertension, accentuating this way and adding this way. The poor old glomerulus is, of course, the place that takes the brunt of both the oxidative stress and the pro-inflammatory milia at the same time as the hypertension. So this is why the glomeruli drop out, essentially, and stop working, and which is why initially we get the proteinuria and then we get the sclerosis and the loss of function. We're very familiar with the delicacy of the balance between arterial, arteriolar uh, tone in the afferent and efferent arterioles and angiotensin II and endothelium, which is relevant to a, a recent study presented in, uh, in Melbourne at the um, International Society of Hypertension. 
or antecedent antagonism. But essentially, this is, this is the area here that determines the tone in the efferent arteriole. And glomerular hypertension is a cardinal feature of hypertension itself transmitted through the blood vessels, diabetes, oxidative stress, obesity. So the agents that we're going to be trying to use to prevent progression of kidney disease will themselves reduce glomerular hypertension. If they do so, they may reduce filtration. And we know that's the case. But although they reduce filtration temporarily, they protect the kidney from breakdown. Let's look at that later when we come to specifically the action of the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors, which we'll be talking about in a little while. So when we talk about diabetes, when we understand that there is uh, a big problem here, we need to understand that diabetes, it, 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 there's a lot of things we get under the bundle term diabetes. We get the microalbuminuria, we get the hypertension, we get some hyperglycemia, some dyslipidemia, and all of these lend themselves to secondary pre prevention of cardiovascular disease. And we know from the Steno study, both the original and the Steno 2 study, which is the follow-up, followed up for about eight years, that if we really apply intensive therapy across the board, we increase exercise, we change the diet, we treat the blood pressure, we treat the sugar, we treat the cholesterol, and we secondarily prevent CBD, we can get a major uh, reduction in absolute risk uh, for, of adverse outcome, a composite endpoint of kidney heart uh, endpoints. And that, that improvement can be maintained even if you take people off intensive therapy. For practical purposes, intensive therapy in Steno2 required an awful lot of input. This is not something normal patients following a normal life can ever possibly hope to emulate. But it does show you that if you attack multiple things at the same time, you get a much better outcome than one risk factor at a time, which previously has been our modus vivendi. But it's been the wrong approach. We need to be tackling everything at once. And the cumulative effect of doing that is beneficial. And that's why when we choose our medicines, we need to be looking at medicines that can have one, more than one effect at the same time, ideally. Certainly for microvascular uh, events, nephropathy, retinopathy, and autonomic neuropathy, the intensive treatment in Steno2 was dramatically better than was seen in, with the conventional arm. And progression to macroalbuminuria was also significantly reduced. And if we can stop people getting to macroalbuminuria, we can surely stop them progressing fast to the point where they'll lose GFR. And that really is one of the cardinal aims. So I'm not suggesting that uh, protein and kidney targets are not important. I don't want a medicine that treats cardiovascular disease but accentuates or increases proteinuria while it does so. I want a treatment that treats blood pressure, that treats cholesterol, that treats sugar, and that reduces proteinuria. This is the orthodoxy that we've all learned, and it's still true today, as you'll see when we look at the newer agents. So um, in prevention, it's all about a concerted effort. Here again, finally, the last figure for the, um, for the uh, Steno2 study is you can see here that the intensive therapy group, they still progressed. Don't forget, when we're talking about treatments, Lots of people, certainly the people who make the medicines, will tell you that this is a dramatic step forward. There's a 50% reduction, blah, 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 blah. The reality is you have to look at the absolute risk reduction, not the relative risk reduction. And what you find in practice is that this is useful, but even these things are not enough because it still leaves people progressing. If we say that we're not progressing this fast, we are still progressing this fast, Obviously, I want a treatment that stops progression completely. No such treatment exists. Well, I say that. If you take out the idea of a kidney pancreas transplant, and we all know that very few patients are suitable for such an enormous procedure and that it comes at a significant price, both financially and for the patient, um, there's no such treatment that arrests uh, uh, progression at this point. And again, what I was saying earlier, we want to keep people alive well with no end-stage renal failure. I don't want them to have diabetic heart disease. I don't want them to have end-stage renal failure. I want them to be in the green section. So we have to be treating not just to prevent this, but to prevent that and prevent people leaving the green. And you can see here, if you look at it that way, that uh, patients on intensive treatment from Steno2 
many more of them stay green. Many fewer of them become red, uh, <coughs> dark orange or amber, if you like, and pale yellow. And that's what we need to be doing. So everybody knows, everybody knows that end-stage renal failure can be improved or prevented by the use of renin angiotensin system blockade. Everybody knows that. And here is a figure that brings together from a publication five years ago a whole stack of things that tell you that if you start with normal albuminuria or microalbuminuria or overt nephropathy, which is here defined as 300 milligrams uh, per, per liter of uh, overt nephropathy of, of microalbuminuria, converting into macroalbuminuria and then heavy proteinuria, even in end-stage renal failure or close to it, Remember that RENAL from 2001 and IDNT from 2001, these were studies with GFRs of around 45 to 50 and proteins of 1 to 3 grams per day. Big, big, heavy diabetic kidney disease, well over to this end of the spectrum, right over here, which is close to where dialysis might start. We need to be intervening much earlier. The proteinuria gives us the clue, and that's why now with IRMA2 and other tr trials, we are starting to intervene prophylactically to prevent this progression from the left right over to the right and over here would be dialysis. So these are the clues we've got and we know what, to, what we can be using. At the end of the day, we know that ACEs and ARBs are the most effective agents for the prevention of end-stage renal disease. Um, okay, I am a believer that if you reduce blood pressure, it's a good thing. And there will be some benefit from doing that. But if you can reduce blood pressure and at the same time improve proteinuria, you'll do a better job. So there's evidence really that ACEs, ARBs are better in terms of renal protection than other agents. This is true, by the way, only for people with heavy proteinuria. This difference tends to disappear when patients don't have much proteinuria or none at all then it's just the blood pressure reduction effect that's beneficial. So don't forget what I've said. All blood pressure reduction, however you do it, is valuable. But in the context of diabetes, particularly, using ACEs and ARBs is much more valuable than just the blood pressure reduction on its own. There's a favorable trend for non-fatal cardiovascular events, but not quite there. So I can show you renal protection I can't show you cardiovascular protection just using ACEs and ARBs. Why? Because to be quite frank with you, the cases, uh, the studies that we're looking at here, Advance IDNT, were of a few thousand patients or a few hundred patients. Nothing like big enough to show this. You will see when we discuss the cardiovascular factors later, uh, and particularly around the SGLT2s, that those studies are huge, much bigger than our renal studies. And you need these really big population-based studies in order to understand the impact on cardiovascular mortality. So in kidney medicine, we just haven't done it because we've been satisfied only to study the kidney itself. Now, even if, as I showed you, the, the cardiovascular protection is borderline, it's nearly there, but it is borderline. If we look at the renal protection, you can see categorically that there is. But look, it's only 20%, 20% reduction in the risk ratio. It leaves you with, to make the point very obvious, 80% of risk that's still there. That's why there's so much target that we need to be targeting with new drugs. But in diabetes, from 2001, that was when Renal and IDNT were, stu were studied, until 2015, there was no other agent that we could use that would actually impact beneficially in this population. We were stuck playing the same record year after year. But that has begun to change. Why? Well, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons is that diabetes, A, is becoming more popular, and B, has had a lot of thought put into it about why and how people become hyperglycemic. And as a result of understanding the underlying mechanisms, ways in which you might be able to influence the tendency to hyperglycemia and get diabetes in the first place. And that's meant lots more drugs. Now, metformin, that goes back 60 years. Uh, Thylazidones, they go back about 20 or 30 years. Um, quite frankly, they're useful, but there's no 
payback really that we can see from a cardiovascular perspective. You know there was all this story about metformin stopping cancers. Yeah, maybe uh, in older people, needs proper trials to establish that beyond doubt. Um, in cretins, look where they occur, they, they occur here, affecting the GI system. Obviously the microbiome and the impact between the bowel contents and, and the bloodstream, terrifically important. The incretins here, the incretins here. So changing these things, changing weight, changing appetite, obviously having an impact on hyperglycemia. Uh, an area that I don't think you would immediately have thought as being very important, but just shows you how wrong you can be. And I'll admit, actually, when I first heard about these SGLT2 inhibitors, I first heard about them in, give me a moment, 2013, because I was looking at some of the phase two data that were coming through. I was quite surprised that whether these would have a major effect on both the kidney and, and diabetes. Just shows you uh, how wrong I am. That's probably why I don't win the lottery very often, because I'm not good at predicting the future. These have become the biggest area of excitement and interest of everything. This isn't a complete diagram. There are other mechanisms as well, of course, but I'm just showing you that people have started to ask the question, how can we influence sugar? And if we influence sugar, what else can we bring to the party? We do know that improving sugar can play a modest improvement in, in outcomes in terms of all-cause mortality here, the ACCORD study. But it is at a cost because if you aggressively target sugar control, there are situations in which you can actually increase death. I'm not too surprised about that because just like short-acting blood pressure agents that precipitately drop blood pressure, that's dangerous. If you precipitately drop, drop blood sugar, especially where the uh, mechanisms that can counteract that are defective, let's say somebody's got an impaired sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, impaired autoregulation, you can leave people dangerously hypoglycemic, and as a result, they can get a heart attack or a stroke or some other neurological problem of that sort. So you could say, well, look, look, why don't we just get diabetes right and everything else will fall into place? Well, I think that's a bit optimistic, at least with current therapies. So although it's important to try to get diabetes as well controlled as you can, there really comes a point where you don't gain more by trying harder. So that's a caveat. And improvement in control can certainly also benefit uh, patients in CKD, but there is a risk of increasing the hazard ratio if you push too hard. CKD patients are very um, fragile. Let's, let's use the word fragile. They have a lot going on with them. They have a lot of pathomechanisms at the same time. You can get their sugars down from 7.5 to 6.5 in glycated hemoglobin, but you can throw up potential uh, uh, toxicity and, and safety signals by being too aggressive or by not selecting the patients carefully enough, which is actually the real solution for the future, is not to treat all patients as though they're the same, but actually realize that people are different and everybody needs to be uh, phenotyped more accurately. There is some evidence that the use of metformin has uh, an association with reduction in all-cause mortality, but that is not done with a proper metformin randomized control study. This is a population study and the inference, it's an inference, it's not a proved case. So would you go out there and test metformin? No, you would not because we all are obsessed with metformin toxicity and the so-called acquired lactic acidosis. So metformin really only has a value in GFRs uh, 60 and above. Some people will go down as low as 45. I've never been comfortable going lower. I accept that some people have tried to study that. As I've just said, I've never been comfortable going any lower than 45. So metformin is good for controlling sugar and is good at the earlier stages, but it is a drug of little or no use as GFR starts to change and we get from 3A to 3B. At that point, in my opinion, we have to switch horses and go to something else. And what is that something else? Well, one of the things that has become hugely popular is the concept of glucose reabsorption and glucose filtration. So essentially, with SGLT2 and GLUT2 in the proximal tubule, there's an enormous amount of glucose reabsorption. 
This can be blocked. It's a high capacity but low affinity system. And that can mean if we block this, we can get a little bit of glucose excretion. And we all know that in normal health, uh, there's about 40 to 60 grams of glucose a day uh, that comes down this far. And essentially, you don't get anything actually appearing in the urine. But in the situation of diabetes, you do. Or if you block this high capacity, low affinity system, you get spillover of glucose all the way through here. And then, of course, you will essentially produce more glucose in the urine. So the urine will contain more glucose per unit volume. Now, I would not have predicted that would have been a particularly powerful mechanism for kidney patients. But it is at an early stage of kidney disease. It really is. We'll come back to how the SGLT2s work in more advanced kidney disease in a little while. So one of the things that definitely happens when you have diabetes and when you add in an SGLT2 inhibitor is you change intraglomerular hemodynamics. You reduce intraglomerular pressure and reduce uh, tubuloglomerular feedback. And this has a beneficial effect on the function of the podocytes and the function of the uh, mesangium itself. So just having diabetes is bad. Correcting that with SGLT2 inhibition is good because you get this dilatation here. Can you? I'll do it with the arrow. Compare the dilatation here of the efferent arteriole with the constricted situation that you get uh, without the SGLT2 inhibitor. And do you know what that is? It's exactly the same, exactly the same that you get with angiotensin II. Constriction, ACE and ARB, vasodilatation. Same thing. You may well ask, can ACEs and ARBs and SGLT2s uh, summate and come together? Yes, they can. And yes, they do, as you'll see from the trials. So there's a double benefit, another double whammy, by using them in concert with things we know work already. Do we really understand how they work? No, I'm not so sure. We do block uh, glucose reabsorption, yes, because the inhibitors suppress the action of SGLT2. But we also, we also do some other odd things. It does increase, these, this action does increase the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis in ketosis prone type 2 diabetics. Now they're rare. But if you have somebody who has presented with ketosis, with type 2 diabetes, rare but not unknown, then be careful by using SGLD2 because you may accentuate that problem. So that's one caveat to use. The dosing uh, is very GFR dependent. And at the moment, we do not recommend, just like metformin, so you're going to say it's like metformin. It is like metformin. Once you go below 45, it's really hard to use these therapies certainly when the GFR is persistently lower and nothing is indicated in less than 30. So again, this agent is quite similar to others that we've been talking about and is really at its most useful when the GFR is less than 90 but above 45. Really important. That is, of course, where most people are. So that's helpful. So I want you to see how basically there's synergism between ACEs and ARBs and SGLT2s inhibitors working on the kidney affecting the kidney, affecting the blood pressure with synergism. And that it, you basically you get the same sort of thing happening, uh, reducing the amount of endogenous hepatic glucose uh, and leading to changes in weight and other metabolic factors that are helpful. This is comparing with the, D, uh, the DPP4Is where you do not get the same degree of effect. You get a different set of actions, a different set of outcomes compared to SGLT2s. And we will increasingly, I think, be choosing these drugs for patients with kidney disease, with heart failure, and with bad control of diabetes. Those are the indications. Bad control, we need to make it better. Kidney failure, we need to act on proteinuria and GFR. Heart failure, these have, as I'll show you, a mild diuretic action, partly osmotic, possibly by other mechanisms. And that tends to help reduce the incidence of heart failure. And heart failure in diabetes and kidney disease is a huge killer. And we don't have a lot that seems to work in that situation. Let's move on. Tubular <coughs> glomerular feedback, very important, mediated at the macula densa. The increased GFR that you get with hyperfiltration leads to decreased sodium delivery to the macula densa and fluid retention. SGLT2s can counter that and restore tubular glomerular feedback. This is what we believe is going on. 
thereby restoring the proper functioning of tubules uh, and reducing hyperfiltration. Certainly, I'll show you evidence that when you start uh, an SGLT2, you get a big drop in GFR, just as you do with ACE inhibitors, by the way. Don't forget that. But after that, the stabilization, because the hyperfiltration that comes with the increase in GFR is followed by increased proteinuria and then progressive loss of GFR later. Essentially, what George Bacteris has been talking about for a very long time. And when we start to use these drugs, we can see drugs like canagliflozin, one of the earliest that was ever used. Um, you can see that there is in, uh, an impact in the S1 segment of the proximal tubule, and you get the impact on the sugar. And you can see that in terms of the KI values for the canagliflozin, in terms of SG, SGLT1 and 2, there's the specificity just down to 4 nanomolar, so it's really tight for 2 and not very effective on 1, which is really what we want in this sort of situation. So SGLT2 inhibition up here, just look what it leads to. It produces glycosuria. Now, let's just stop for a minute. Whatever, when have you ever gone into a therapy and said, I want to produce sugar in the water? And you haven't, because that's the very first time. It also increases uric acid excretion. If you're a believer that uric acid is a marker of oxidative stress, that might be good. It also induces a negative calorific balance. Calorific balance. Patients lose weight. The, sh the sugar control improves, so they get less glucose toxicity. Plasma uric acid drops. You get a reduction in atherosclerosis, so it is said. Because you lose weight, you lose the epicardial horrible fat that sits around the heart and the kidney. As a result, you get better functioning heart and kidney. Over this side, you get naturesis. This is the diuretic factor. The blood pressure falls. Tubular glomerular feedback has improved, hence the naturesis. You get a reduction in plasma volume, reduction in, in myocardial stretch, a reduction in, in glomerular hypertension. So I'm getting cardio, there's the heart, and renal, there's the kidney protection at the same time. It's the perfect double whammy. We've got problems here and problems there and problems here with diabetes. It's actually a triple whammy. We're affecting the diabetes, we're affecting the heart, we're affecting the kidney. And that's why these agents seem to be pretty effective at improving outcomes. There are a number of these agents, by the way, and not all of them have had big studies to show them. It's very difficult to tell them apart. I mean, the trials are simple enough to tell apart. At the moment, here's my take. Somebody will say to you, oh, it's a class effect. They're all the same. And probably for ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, that's probably true. But I don't yet believe that we can quite say that with EMPA, CANA, and DAPA, that they're all exactly the same. Not yet. Maybe five years' time? We will. But where we are now, I think you have to look at the trials, look at the population, and consider what it is you're trying to achieve, and choose the agent selectively and appropriately, therefore. So we've looked at that already. And here are the drugs as they accumulate. So the mechanism, again, you can see affecting the kidney. So what's the actual story? When we compare them with DD, uh, DPP4 inhibitors, we can see that they are perhaps a little less good at dropping glycated hemoglobin. DPP4s don't really affect weight, but SGLT2s do. So if the patient's obese and can't lose weight, this is helpful. Both have a minimal risk of hypoglycemia. Now, the DPP4s, because they don't increase sugar in the urine, don't increase the risk of genital mycosis or UTI. Absolutely, these do. If males have not got a circumcision, there's an increased incidence of balanitis, and there is an increase of genital mycosis. Uh, scrupulous hygiene can help reduce this, but it is still there. DPP4s you can't use when you get into and close to dialysis. Well, again, is it 30, is it 45? I think essentially under 45, you're having to use increased caution with these drugs. Uh, a bit like, the, I'm afraid, metformin. It starts to be less useful. And do you know that once you get below a GFR of about 45, the SGL, SGLT2 inhibitors do not reduce sugar anymore because the kidney can't respond in the same way. They do affect the blood pressure. They do affect the weight through a diuretic effect. They do affect the uric acid, but they don't really affect blood sugar. It doesn't drop, and the glucose excretion through the damaged and failing kidney is not enough to make a difference. So however they work later on, it isn't through that mechanism. There is also this eu eu glycemic DKA 
and um, there are some electrolyte problems because of this diuretic thing, because of the osmotic diuresis. If you throw in a diuretic as well, like frizomide, on top of the osmotic diuresis, you can get acute kidney injury through dehydration. So you need to be cautious about the hydration state when you start these particular agents. By the way, that's no different from ACEs and ARBs, because if you're careless with diuretics with ACEs and ARBs, you'll get acute kidney injury there, so-called, because you'll have a marked increase in creatinine at that point. So if we now go on to the beneficial effects, we've had that. Let's look at some of the trials. This is the one, Empareg. You know the story, don't you? The uh, FDA and the EMEA in particular insisted that the companies trying to bring in these drugs for the treatment of diabetes had to do cardiovascular protection studies. That's because there was a theoretical risk of accentuating or accelerating cardiovascular death because of these new therapies. And very sensibly, the regulators said, just a moment, let's just make sure that these are safe to use. So this was a huge study, but really only to test the cardiovascular safety of a medicine. Nobody, certainly nobody in the company, and I don't think any of the doctors participating in the trial ever imagined for a minute that there would be an improvement in cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. But there was. So if we look here, in terms of the primary combined outcomes, all the deaths from cardiovascular causes, deaths from any causes, and hospitalization for heart failure, there were improvements that you could see. Some of them were just at the margins of statistical significance, so the composite was 0 0.04, but cardiovascular death and heart failure were very impressive. Now let's go back. These are drugs given to patients with less than perfect diabetes, but who may not or may or may not have cardiovascular disease and problems, but you're not giving them the empaglyphosin to improve the cardiovascular problems, you're really only giving it to improve the sugar. And when you do so, you get these tremendous cardiovascular benefits. Totally surprising to everybody concerned. The same favorable effects were seen with canagliflozin as well as empagliflozin. And indeed, there, are, there is a, a very recent trial in the Lancet, I think, of canagliflozin showing that in both people with and without a cardiovascular disease uh, a predisposition, you can get the same beneficial effect. Not all studies with not all drugs always show the same degree of effect. But here, 0 0.02 as opposed to 0 0.04 for the P, the superiority of canagliflozin. Again, um, it's, it's as much to do with uh, heart failure as it is with other sort of agents as well. Not all components of the cardiovascular disease are affected uh, um, equally, but heart failure is a pretty consistent one when you come to put the two together. And if you, if you, put, uh, if you put these things in real life together, you can see that in real life where you're actually using these studies, these are registries, post-marketing post, um, registries in the U.S., in the Nordic countries, which are very good at keeping registries, even in the UK, where we're rather less good at keeping registries, and that's why our results were with much wider confidence intervals, I suspect, that there was a consistent effect across the board of a, a, a reduction in the events. And in fact, this degree of reduction, which is 50%, I've never seen this with another therapy. It's as simple as that. It's extraordinary. So it seems to work in, in real life even better than it works in uh, a trial situation. Also, a lower risk of heart failure hospitalization. That comes out of almost every study that's been done. And these are patients who are prone to heart failure, both because they have heart, uh, they have kidney disease and because they have diabetes. Is there a blood pressure reduction? Yep, there is a blood pressure reduction. It's not huge. And it's irrespective of the use of pre-existing diuretics or rasplicade. It's about two or three, maybe four, but let's say it's around three millimeters of mercury. Not insignificant, not a deal maker or a deal breaker, but it's consistent across all of the agents that they do reduce blood pressure, at least, caveat coming, at least in patients who have um, preserved kidney function. It's a less impressive response, although it is still there in people who have more advanced kidney disease. So as, you, as I can show you, whether you have ACE or ARB or not, you do get an effect. Now, the effect is bigger on patients with ACEs and ARBs than patients not taking ACEs and ARBs. It is there, but it's bigger with ACEs and ARBs. Why? Obvious answer, 
because the volume depletion, however you achieve it, whether it's with a thiazide diuretic, a loop diuretic, or an osmotic diuretic, accentuates the action of ACEs and ARMS because the lower your blood volume, plasma circulating volume, the more dependent your blood pressure is on angiotensin II, and of course you then inhibit that with ACEs and ARMS. So again, caveat, be cautious how you introduce these things, particularly in the pre-existing di diuretic phase, because you could overdo it and the blood pressure would drop by 10 or 15 millimeters of mercury, and there might be a sharp a precipitate fall, temporary fall, but nevertheless a fall in kidney function, and nobody wants to do that. Uh, improvement in blood pressure and improvement in pulse pressure makes you wonder whether it's having an effect on arterial rigidity or compliance or endothelial function. I don't have data on that, but it's certainly something you should look at to see whether you have these so-called pleiotropic effects that go beyond the obvious mechanisms that we can measure and see. Okay, well, risk factors, la di da, all wonderful, but what does it do on the kidney? Because let's not forget, I, you know, we're kidney specialists. We're very pleased with the reduction in heart failure, and we're very pleased with the reduction in overall cardiovascular problems. But I do want to at least ensure that there might be an improvement in kidney function as well. So what happens with all of these agents versus an agent that doesn't have these effects? So an agent that might reduce sugar but doesn't affect the other factors like blood pressure and uric acid, etc., etc. If you have the control here, you see a drop in GFR. Now, you administer an agent like canagliflozin or empagliflozin or any glyphosin, and what you see is a sharp reduction in GFR, typically around 5 mils per minute. And that is just like when you in, uh, exhibit an ACE inhibitor or, or an angiotensin receptor blocker. It's an acute effect on the change in glomerular pressure and the reduction in filtration. It very rapidly bounces back. And after you've had this acute effect, then everything stays pretty stable. Whereas patients not exposed to these drugs don't have the acute drop, but what they do have is a progressive drop due to the underlying condition carrying on remorselessly. It's just the same as an ACE and an ARM. You know it happens. And we've learned to live with it and not fret about it too much. It can take a couple of years before you get the clear unequivocal benefit between the two groups. But actually, in many studies, it's there in as little as one year. So it's useful. Uh, no, di no difference in cardiovascular effects. How does it change uh, mortality? What are the most important mediators? I don't know. It certainly changes uric acid. It certainly changes hematocrit. By the way, it obviously pushes hematocrit up because it's reducing plas plasma volume. So there are the same number of red cells, but suspended in a smaller plasma volume. So there is a small increase, but there's no increase in stroke. You're worrying now about stroke, aren't you? Because you're thinking of EPO. epo shmepo I say. EPO is a specific effect for EPO. It's not to do with these drugs and a change in hematocrit. So don't worry about that. So slower rate of renal progression, and then if we follow it out, not just for two years, like I showed you a moment ago, but we follow it out for a cumulative probability of reaching a combined renal endpoint, doubling of creatinine. That's a good one, isn't it? We like that. Uh, you can see a marked reduction, almost 50% reduction. That's big. That really is big. That's bigger than an ACE and an ARP. That's impressive. Okay, yes, people are still progressing, but over a three and a half year period, and by the time you finish the study, it's half the patients. So that's a bigger effect than ACEs and ARBs had. They only could reduce this by 20%. We can now reduce it by about 40%. And it adds on to what the ACEs and ARBs have already done. So we have, we have things like worsening nephropathy or cardiovascular death improved. Worsening nephropathy on its own improved. Progression to macroalbuminuria from microalbuminuria improved. Doubling of serum creatinine improved. Initiation of renal replacement therapy improved. Just. Why? Because it takes so many years to get there. So it's no surprise. You'd have to have a trial double the length before you could properly report on dialysis outcomes. Doubling of serum creatinine and GFR less than 45 improved. Uh, incident albuminuria, it doesn't do anything for people who don't have albuminuria. But why would we use it there? We're using it in patients who are sending us a kidney signal. A kidney signal is albuminuria. They are prone to, they are needing this drug. Heart failure patients need this drug. Poor sugar control patients need this drug. 
There's no particular need to give it to somebody who doesn't have albuminuria and normal kidney function because you can't protect what's already good and normal. So I can see it's not for every diabetic, no matter what the companies try to tell you. It's not correct to say it's for everybody. Does it work at all stages of GFR? I don't know, but there is evidence that you can certainly go down lower. If we look at this, which is nearly impossible to see, but you can see the different GFR ranges here. I'm confident it's still working at 45. I'm a little less confident it's still working at 30. So I'm happy to use these agents in CKD stage 1, 2, 3A, and 3B. In 4, well, you could, but I think you'd have to monitor the patients carefully. That's all I would say. And not all of them have licenses for CKDs down to 4. By then, in any case, if you've got to 4, or no matter what you use, I fear, you will end up going down the slippery slope to 5. The name of the game is to stop people progressing from 2 to 3, 3A to 3B, and from 3B to 4. That's what we need to be doing. Uh, there is evidence, though, that it will reduce albuminuria, even at that late stage, by a little bit. So why not use it if the sugar needs it, although the sugar won't improve that much? It may also improve the blood pressure a little bit. What I'd like to see is specific trials in these populations with bigger numbers before I'm confident that this is the right stuff to use right through CKD stage 4 and close to dialysis. But the, there's no evidence of increasing harm. Turn, this, turn the issue around. There's no evidence of increasing harm in these patients if you do continue to use the drugs even as GFR declines. I'm not going to say much about DDP4 inhibitors today. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, what I'm really going to finish with in this lecture is there are other therapies you can use. There are some beneficial effects those therapies have. But we are kidney physicians, first and foremost. What we have to look at is patients whom we see with microalbuminuria, then with a reducing GFR, they have a relative hypertension, they're relatively volume expanded, they have a slightly high or very high uric acid concentration, they are more anemic than they should be, and in this sort of situation, they're also hyperglycemic because it's hard to get their sugars down and well controlled, and I showed you earlier the risk of doing it abruptly and aggressively with too much insulin. So what you really want to do is to see to what extent you can control all these things smoothly, gently, and prevent progression. And <clears throat> if you look at chronic maintenance therapy over a period of about three to four years, these are patients who do not have, in this case, uh, this is Empereg outcome study, looking at the patients further down the track from the initial study that I reported for you, you can see that the GFR dropped all the way across the whole page from about 74 to about 64. So three mils per minute per year loss. Contrast that with the group of patients who were on empagliflozin. And although they had a GFR at the outset that was lower, only because they were on empagliflozin. I told you, you drop about three or four mils a minute when you start it. But thereafter, over the same time period, nothing. Static. That's the sort of drug I want for patients that otherwise do this. I see them here, 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 and then eventually on dialysis. I don't want that. So if you look at the changes in GFR in the subgroups, you can see that the overall population was extraordinarily static. Um, you know, all the other factors here that could influence it in terms of blood pressure and sugar were all uh, improved by the presence of empagliflozin in this context. So I think for us nephrologists, we are finally coming to a point in our lives when we realize this, that this type of drug, SGLT2, is a drug that impacts beneficially on chronic kidney disease progression. Diabetes now, later we'll look at it in non-diabetes. Wouldn't that be interesting? It impacts on the disease progression of diabetic kidney disease. It impacts favorably on heart failure, favorably on cardiovascular mortality. And it has a single side effect that's of relevance. It causes glycosuria. It's the other way around from how the diabetic doctors look at it. They look at it as another way to control sugar. Okay, we're interested in that, of course. But I'm really much more interested in a drug that can preserve kidney function over a long period of time. If the sugar's a bit better, hey, that's nice to see.
So that's the diabetic uh, payback. I want the kidney payback first and foremost. And with that, I hope a cardiovascular payback as well. So that completes my 50-minute uh, lecture. I'm now very happy to take questions on this topic in general if people would like to type them in and I'll attempt to answer them as they come through. Thank you. Right, there's something here. Let me have a look, see if I can find it. Is, uh, oh, I can't read it. Is better SGLT2 inhibitor or insulin? Oh, my. Well, look, insulin is not a nice thing to use. It's cheap, but it causes weight gain, fluid retention. It's difficult to get good control with insulin, and patients are really un unkeen on it. There's no evidence that insulin treatment improves survival. Or improves kidney function so I'm afraid okay you say that's because they haven't done the trials yes that's true but the reality is as we see it at the moment insulin is not really an answer if the insulin is the answer I don't know what the question is apart from your question now another one uh, metformin is good is contraindicated yeah it's contraindicated in all kidney disease not just uh, diabetes but obviously it's used mainly in that context because it undergoes renal excretion uh, so it's metabolites. So what population is good? A fixed combination dose? Well, I am happy with that in any GFR down to 60. And I think you can use this if you can go down to 45, provided you have good supervision. And good supervision means not just under primary care, but actually monitoring patients on a more regular basis. That is a potent combination. Because that does your sugar for you, the metformin, and this one does the other bits you want to see as well. Is it safe to do what? There's a question coming. It's not been completed. Is this safe to combine the two? Yes, I think it's safe to combine the two. Metformin is also very cheap. I do understand that these agents are not cheap. There's a new agents. Drug companies are going to charge a premium for them until we get some generics or some me too's or somebody can make them cheap um, in a different way. But from my perspective, um, they will start to be used progressively. Now, no guideline to my knowledge has been revised to say that these come before metformin. But I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to say that patients who have declining kidney function, patients who have proteinuria despite the presence of ACE and ARB, patients that have a poor sugar control, patients whose GFR is greater than 45, patients at risk of heart failure, I think that these are more important than metformin. If I had to choose on my desert island, although I'd be able to afford a lot of metformin because it's cheap, I would prefer to take fewer pills of SGLT2 because it's effective. That's my view. You may find other doctors who take a different view. Any other questions from the attendees? Ask me anything. Yes, I think you do. This is a question about if the patient's already on a sulfonylurea. I think you can't have everything. So um, if they're on a sulfonylurea, sulfonylureas, even glimepramide, which is better from the point of view of uh, renal function, again, it doesn't have the beneficial effects that these new agents do have. Now, let's be clear. I said at the outset that the sugar-reducing effect of SGLT2s is modest. Let's say it's about 0.5 millimoles per litre. Some of these other agents, including sulfonylureas, can have 0.7 to even over 1 millimole per litre reduction in blood sugar. So it depends on your patient. If your patient has absolutely terrible, terrible sugar control, then you will want agents that will help to bring that down the fastest. Why? Because the sugar control is the priority. So you'll get better sugar control using uh, glimepiride and other sulfonylureas than you will ever get with SGLD2s. But if you've got the sugar control down to a sensible level, then there's no point increasing further the sulfonylurea. You would be better off using an SGLD2. And yes, you sh should certainly consider changing that because these drugs are still prone for hypoglycemia, the, the sulfonylureas. There's very little tendency for 
SGLD2s, but combinations are more difficult to handle and patients need to be properly informed or trained. Now, which drug is safe in a single kidney? That's a curious question. Do you mean a transplant kidney or do you mean a patient who's been born with a single kidney? A patient who's been born with a single kidney and is in good health will have absolutely safe uh, use of these drugs because, as you know, if you're born with a single kidney, the single kidney grows and hypertrophies is bigger than this, uh, any other single, is bigger than the either of the kidneys that would have been there. If you see what I'm trying to say. Essentially, it's bigger and has more function. So typically, patients with a, a single kidney have normal kidney function. Hence, they're able to donate kidneys when one of their relatives needs something uh, in a living donor situation. So that's absolutely safe as far as I'm concerned. Is anybody unhappy with using SGLT2s? Are they available where you are? Do you have them all sitting there on the shelf ready to go? Or are they being held behind price uh, barriers? Or are they being held behind uh, some other barrier? I'd be interested to know. Because we have them, and they now are increasingly appearing in guidelines uh, and are in very much in renal settings begun to be used a lot more. But, you know, I think we nephrologists, we have to learn that we know more about diabetes than the diabetologists, and we know more about heart failure than the cardiologists. They don't think so. They don't know that we know that and that we know more, but we do. So when we see these patients, if the, if the diabetologist is unkeen or doesn't seem interested in kidney protection by these different mechanisms, our job is to say, but what about an SGLT2 inhibitor here? Wouldn't that help improve the blood pressure, reduce the plasma volume, uh, synergize with the use of ACEs and ARBs, reduce the proteinuria? Aren't these things that we want to achieve for our patient and improve the sugar a little bit as well? That's the sort of thing. We have to fly the flag for our patients in these multidisciplinary meetings and not just imagine that our kidney patients are like all the other patients because they're certainly not. They need special advocacy, I would say. Any uh, Anything else? Very interested to hear other questions or answer anything else you may want to do. Maybe everybody's clear and is now totally persuaded. Uh, but, uh, even, oh, there's one more question for you. Yes, I mean, elderly patient, is it safe? I mean, the, the same thing really applies to elderly patients as all patients. If by elderly you mean they've got advanced cardiovascular disease and poor kidneys, I think they're actually more eligible and more likely to, to benefit from this agent than younger patients who've got, as it were, longer to go before they reach a particular threshold to get a cardiovascular event. Now, obviously, you've got to have stable kidney function and you've got to be in a situation where you can administer a medicine and see what happens. So provided they're well looked after and well followed up, I actually think it's as safe and potentially more beneficial than it would be in a younger patient. So my answer is yes, it is safe there. Okay, well, that might be um, our, our job done. So, yep, that's right. Thank you for your time in the webinar. I enjoyed doing it. I hope you got something from it. This is a rapidly moving area. I can tell you that in the next year or so, we'll have some really exciting new trials. One of the things to look out for, you nephrologists, is the use of these agents, SGLD2 inhibitors, but not in diabetic kidney disease, in general kidney disease. Wouldn't it be fascinating? If they work there as well, wouldn't it be amazing if we started to use drugs for diabetes, but in people who haven't got diabetes? Wow. I think we might know something more about that, maybe within the next 12 months. So keep your eyes peeled for the New England Journal, the Lancet, all these big journals, JAMA, so on and so forth, because you may get a surprise. Anyway, that's me done. Thank you for your attention. 
Hope you enjoyed it and uh, on to the next thing. Thank you very much.